onto the onto the screen here. I got that thing. I, I think I've got fruitable, uh, mutable, revocable, and yet scalable, governable, and constrainable. So uh, just for the benefit. Right, uh, we are just about ready to roll. We are keeping the folks. All yours, Alan. All mine, so we can get started. Cool. So we've had our coffee and we've had those lovely little chocolate things with the passion fruit in them, which was a nice, pleasant surprise when you bit into those. So we're now going to start up and we've got an interesting, in my mind, panel discussion because we have three analysts from Cook and Jacob representing all around the world, we've got Matthias, John, and Graham. And so I thought what would be an interesting thing here is to talk a little bit about CIAM and how it sort of differs regionally, how we look around the world. So the first question I'm going to put out to each of you, first of all, is to do a, a, a one paragraph introduction of yourself and where you fit into things. And then the first question that sort of we can talk about is, in terms of CIAM, how are they different in each of our different regions? And so I can start off with Mateus, you're sitting right there, you get to go first. <laughs> Okay, where do I fit in? I'm, I'm a senior analyst and lead advisor for Cook and Co. in Cook um, Co. in Germany and the European area there. And I, I'm doing all kinds of work for all the three pillars that we do, so it's research, it's advisory, and it's events. And I'm John Zolbert. I work out of the U.S. office, uh, lead analyst, mostly focused on research and events. I'm Graham Williamson. I'm with Kapinga Coal Asia Pacific, which is headquartered here in Singapore. Um, I live in Australia, but I'm not there a lot. Um, and we're brothers in arms, because I too am <laughs> <laughs> a senior analyst, and I mean, we're, we're amongst friends here. Uh, we all have to put up with Mark Kapinga. <laughs> <laughs> There's a tweetable moment. Yes. Yes. Right there. Oh, it's a tweet. Good. is probably no, is in my opinion the world foremost uh, person in terms of understanding the whole identity and access management space as it applies to cloud migration and, and cyber security. But he's a hard taskmaster. So as we're doing our our, our documents, uh, we very often. Uh, get them kicked back and say, fix this up, so we can commiserate over beers <laughs> in that space. Okay, so in, in terms of CIAM, which as a market is sort of established probably within the last 24 months, even 36 months or so, we've been growing up, how, how do each of you see CIAM in each of the regions and specifically how they differ? Um, so, again, I'll, I'll start off with Teos and, and sort of looking from an EU perspective. Yeah, I don't know if it's the EU perspective, but, but what I'm really real, realizing is that people are focusing on customers. You and me, we are focusing on user experience. 
So I think the improvement of user experience not having to create um, a, a single account for each site that you're using, reusing credentials, but and at the same time doing that in a secure uh, and, and privacy aware manner, this is something that I think is, is special for the European market at least. So having both convenience and security privacy at the same time, and this maybe also reflects a bit of what we're we'll, we'll talking about all these three days about GDPR, um, we, we do not want to block our data, we want it only to be used for the right purposes. What about in the US, John? Well, you know, Colin alluded to what I would call vast political differences earlier, and I think that that's really true, and, what, and that manifests itself in probably less of an orientation toward the user experience uh, and more, you know, from a consumer identity perspective, and more, how can we make more money out of people's consumer identities in the U.S.? You know, it's about marketing, targeted marketing. How do we extract, you know, the maximum amount of information so that we can, you know, pop up the ads just in all the right places? There's a lot less concern about privacy, unfortunately. I mean, I have to, that's not, it can't be peanut buttered across everyone in the U.S. There are lots of us who are concerned about privacy, but at the moment I think the reality is that we're, uh, we're not really winning that battle. So CIM is very uh, profit-driven marketing focused on a North American perspective of it. And when? How about, how about, well, we've got Australia, we've got Singapore, and the ground in APAC, and I assume APAC is sort of different across different countries as well. The, there's vast differences across APAC as well as what does consumer identity and access management really mean, and where are we coming from and where are we going to? We're coming from a very uh, diverse uh, environment. I mean, Australia is exceedingly different from Vietnam. Um, the, however, one thing that we are aware of is there is some convergence happening. Um, as the millennial demographic becomes more um, well, larger, because it's growing, uh, and as it becomes more um, enabled in terms of flexing their muscles and doing their own thing and not putting up with what their parents put up with, um, we are seeing that people want very much the same thing. And one of the things that millennials want is a good user experience. So for those, for those of us who are concerned about how to project uh, a service to consumers, it's exceedingly important to start to, real, to, to realize now that it is a user-managed access issue. And so I'm very pleased that, you know, to be here at this Kankara initiative to say, look, let's make sure we get this user-managed access stuff right. Um, and can I, just say, can I just say something about Forge Forgerock? Forgerock's got a couple of good videos on that website that you might want to have a look at on you. Uh, and it gives you a good view of what this means. It means that when I come into a website, I want it to work the way I want it to work. I don't want to be scratching my head and say, how do I do this? As soon as, as, soon as that friction comes, uh, what the millennials do is start to tweet. And you don't want that, okay? If you're a bank, for instance, you don't want them to say, oh, what terrible trouble I've had. You want them to start tweeting. I went into the DBS site today and look what happened. You know, it was great. Uh, so, user managed access um, is, is exceedingly important. It's getting more important in Asia Pack as that convergence occurs. I had absolutely nothing to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good to hear because there's three different, I'm not sure I want to live in your world, uh, the, <laughs> that marketing side of it. But, Looking into our into crystal ball and looking forward here, one of the things, both as implementers and, and vendors, one of the things we have to deal with, that we're forced to deal with is that regulation. And I'm going to start with you, John, and then in terms of if we look into a crystal ball over the next sort of two years, again, from a regional perspective, what kind of regulations do you think are going to become more important, obviously, I'm holding in Europe for the last of this, because it's probably the clearest. 
Do you see any, anything else from the U.S. side of things? Um, I, no, I think there's more of an impetus towards deregulation, actually, at this point. Well, <laughs> it's free for all. Well, yeah, so I mean, I don't see regulatory pressures um, making a huge impact on CIM in the U.S., except as how it relates to other regions. And I think it's that external influence that I'll let Matthias get into, uh, Andrew Graham, uh, that probably will have the most impact on how CIM implementations happen in the U.S. Because as Colin was saying earlier, too, does it make sense for a company that's trying to be a global business to have several different kinds of CIAM systems and what we do with the, the, the citizens' data, depending on what region we're in. Yeah. That, that, that's an interesting sort of commentary on it, given the fact how with regulation like Factor and HIPAA and things like that, the US has actually been fairly in front of those kind of regulations. Yes. And so yet they don't care about privacy. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think there are historically some regulations like HIPAA that have been good, um, but I think we need to wait and see what happens to the spirit of those regulations over the upcoming months. I mean, again, you know, we were talking this morning about FCC and net neutrality. I think that's kind of related to this entire issue. So it's there are a lot of changes going on right now. It's hard to accurately predict what the impact will be uh, for consumers. Graham, what about, so you said you've got a bunch of different countries all behaving very differently. What do you see here? So again, uh, just as a contrast to what we see in Europe, where Europe's put in GDPR because they could, right? It's um, the member states have come together to form an agreement on this is how we're going to deal with privacy. Um, in Asia Pacific, we don't have that uh, ability uh, because we've got all these different countries that are doing things their own way. Uh, but um, one thing we are seeing here, and I just want to put a plug, this actually a very good presentation Thursday afternoon on cross-border privacy, the cross-border privacy rules system that is uh, being adopted in Asia Pacific. So it's an APEC initiative. It started some years ago, uh, but it's now gathering steam. A Singapore joined back in September, or indicated their intention to join back in September. Uh, Australia indicated their intention uh, to join at the November APEC meeting in Vietnam. And so we're seeing um, a groundswell of interest in that. And, and what that's basically saying is, um, okay, Countries that want to join the GDPR map their privacy regulation against a set of nine privacy, uh, privacy framework of nine principles. And then companies within those, those countries uh, join CPPR and get certified to it. And then that gives citizens a, 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 a moment of trust where if you're dealing with a CPP, CPPR compliant or certified company, you can be assured that your privacy is being respected regardless of where your personal information might go. Uh, so, a different attack. Um, I'm not saying GDPR isn't important here, uh, but I believe CPPR is more fitting with the Asia Pacific environment. Which brings us to our friend GDPR. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Europe is, is probably further ahead in terms of those regulations, both GDPR and probably also PSD2 in terms of where those are. Um, where do you see that heading over the next two years? And, and specifically, do you see the impact in the other region? Um, okay, first, first, I, I like the idea that, that, that Graham mentioned that you could do this. And so there, there, that, that is the approach that we have all EU members, member states being put into the same regime after having individual data protection laws before, which was really, yeah, not, not that fun for doing business in the EU. Now it's aligned and it will be aligned by, by May. And this is something that many organizations are still struggling to, to, to comply to. And this is really good work that they are doing. Um, and I would not dare to predict, to predict what happens on the 26th of May. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, 
not, not to talk about the, the one and a half year after that, um, but in general, first of all, all organizations are really trying to work their way to be compliant, or at least to be not in compliant to the GDPR. And of course, this has influences on, on all the other regions, um, as, at least as, as I expect it, as there is this aspect that the GDPR applies to every organization doing business with EU citizens or residents of the EU. Um, and this will be a, a, a really a challenge um, for the organizations there and for the EU to impose any fines there. Um, so this is really an interesting thing to talk about. Um, but, but I think yeah, Europeans and the European citizens are, are in a situation where they are getting closer to a unified regime where they really understand what data protection for them means. And that is something that is good to have it on that large scale for the complete EU. Okay. One more question I will come back to with you start off with it, Graham, in terms of user experience and, and the user side of things. Are the users that we're dealing with in the different regions inherently different? And do you see that as leading to differences around how we address consumer identity? Uh, can I say yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Good, <it's> solid. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, they're different in that, uh, you know, the vast differences in APEC countries mean, from a historical point of view, mean that it's a different approach. So, for instance, like privacy is very much a Western construct. Okay, if you go to Cambodia or Vietnam, privacy is not high on the list. Um, but the, the, the no side of it comes in by the millennials in Vietnam and Cambodia are starting to have exactly the same uh, capabilities and, and uh, interest that uh, the millennials in Singapore and Australia, uh, which is, I've now got a smartphone, and let's face it, the smartphone's one, right? It is the device of choice that people want to, to use. And there's amazing things happening in terms of the capability being built into that. We men mentioned Fido earlier. You know, quite frankly, Fido may, makes that smartphone more secure than that PC on your desk. Uh, so um, the, the capabilities are being built in there with facial recognition, with gesture, uh, sort of brilliant demonstration of gesture. You know, gestures that you do with your mobile phone are unique. I you know, did it three times and got my, got, got, was able to log on to a system. Another person tried to copy my gesture and couldn't, so that's beside the point. Um, <laughs> the millennials, though, are saying, I want to be able to do this. I now have, uh, with the financial side of things, I now have a wallet on my smartphone. I don't need a bank account. Um, it's a fascinating program on TV the other night about banking in Myanmar and what's happening in there in terms of the, what the banks are, are, are doing to support that. But basically, in countries such as that, the phone is now my wallet. And that gives me a, mean, a lot of capabilities, uh, but equally, I need, when it comes to CIDM, I, I, I need that uh, ease of access. And I do need, and I'm just, going to become more important as people um, uh, you know, develop further, uh, I do need that privacy that, that so when I do a transaction that it is being held secure. So there's that, there's that um, convergence happening, I believe, when we go across the region. Okay. Matthias, what about Europe, which is sort of more technologically mature when we come to something like that? Same question. Okay, first of all, yes and no. <laughs> um, as, as we have the, the GDPR and the regulations um, being more prominent in the media and, and, and also for the, for, for the customers and the individual consumers, and of course for the organizations, that gets a, a clear, clear visibility. And this is something that, that I think is true, and this is something that will evolve even more. But you mentioned the millennials. The, I, I have kids which are just 18 and 20, and uh, things change for them completely. <laughs> um, and, and things are really completely different for them. Um, I've, I've just read a statistic that I cannot quote the source, so 
I'm not, maybe I'm violating the terms, <laughs> the terms and conditions here. Um, but uh, the, the, the statistics said that 50% um, of all millennials cannot identify targeted uh, advertisements for them. So they, they see it and they think it's content, not advertisements. Um, and, and wow, that's a big number. Yeah. I don't know if it's true, <laughs> but it shows the, the tendency where it goes to. So um, people are, are no longer, or younger people are no longer really caring that much about privacy as long as they get the content that they want. And I think that is something that maybe needs some education, maybe by me, from my kids. Um, but, but I think there's, there's some work to do, and there, and there is a difference between um, that. And last, last thing, um, there is clearly a, a different notion of privacy when it comes between, to, to at least Asia and, and, and European Europe or Germany. Um, I was surprised to, to give away my passport at the check-in at the hotel here. Um, giving away my passport is something that is like giving away your pants. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's really, um, because in Germany you're usually not allowed to hand over your passport. I'm not talking about making photocopies or something like that. And everybody here is scanning it um, and trying to, 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 to track you down um, for good legal reasons, but it's completely different. And it's something that was at least new to me <coughs> to the point. Okay. John, you get a yes no as well. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, well, you know, I think, I think there are differences looking at users and user experiences around the world. And, and let's, let's just take the Americas as an example, because think of North America, you know, one of the things that we talk about with regard to consumer identity is a lot of the companies try to provide products that provide an omni-channel experience. So, as opposed to other regions around the world where it may be primarily mobile based. We do have laptops, tablets, set-top boxes, you know, connected cars, uh, and I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done yet because the omni-channel experience is not really there. Um, you know, and if that's uh, you know, something that uh, the companies want to try to provide, then they have a long way to go making that a reality. So user experience definitely does have a, a different look and feel, I think, in the U.S., North America, as opposed to South America, because let's say South America, I think, may share some kind of characteristics in common with, say, APAC, where, again, it's a more mobile experience. Uh, but the market hasn't been saturated by consumer identity products there yet. Okay, well that wonderful tone tells me that I'm getting towards the end. Is, is there a question? Any question in the audience? Go ahead. Yeah, I have one follow-up. Yes, a follow-up question. So you said that the millennials right now are not really uh, caring about privacy issues as much, but do you feel that as they grow, maybe in the next you know, 10 years or so, their views will change? And suddenly they will become much more... Uh, much more when they grow up, they'll regret it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but in general, yes, I think so. Um, currently, um, there is this uh, WhatsApp, Snapchat, I don't know what app thing on the mobile phone that does not end at 16, but it will maybe end at 24, or 25, or 28. Um, and I think um, having gone through this phase, they maybe, or I hope that they will realize what, they, what, what it was, what they did, which is not a, a judgment upon what they did, but we need to understand that um, privacy is something that was more or less ignored before, and, and that is something that is valuable after that, because having gone through this phase maybe can also be um, a yeah, school um, the teaching for them to, to learn from afterwards. Currently, I, I, I see not only with my daughters, but, but everywhere, sharing information that is highly private yeah. is very usual, um, and, and this most probably will change after that phase. Um, I, I expect that. Yes, I would, I would say yes. Alan, I, had some, sure. I didn't address the privacy part of my response, so I think you know privacy can be important still in the U.S. I think that uh, 
you know, maybe our approach is, sure, I'll give you my email address if you'll give me $10 off this purchase, and then I'll stick you in my spam folder so that you can try to work it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a way, it's a workaround that we've come to. I think many of us have multiple email addresses for that very reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, with, with that, it brings us to about time, and I don't want to intrude in our lunchtime. So, Katrina, you're coming up next. Uh, Colin, you <laughs>